Well, before I begin, just a couple of comments, if I may. In the previous series of messages that we completed last week, there were times that when it came to certain teachings, I, I thought, so made a real effort to be very respectful and to give proper recognition to the Roman Catholic Church for some of those core doctrines they defended in the early years, particularly the dual nature of Christ, that he was fully God and fully man, and the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. I hope that you saw my effort to show proper respect. This morning, I'm going to try to be gentle, but I'm going to speak the truth about what happened in the years leading up to the Protestant Reformation, why it happened, and how God powerfully used one key figure to set in motion a series of events that literally change the world. And with that in mind, I'd ask you to please stand for the reading of the Word. I'll be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 1. This is verse 16 to 17. Here now is the word of the Lord. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This is us how God made This is accomplished from to finish by faith, as the scriptures say, the righteous will live by faith. Please be seated. Salve, sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura, sola dia gloria, et sola Christe. Don't worry, I'm not speaking in tongues. The words I'm using are Latin, and Latin was the only approved language for God's Word from about the year 380 A.D. until the early 1500s. That's roughly 1,100 years in which the only approved language for the Bible was a language increasingly few, and indeed eventually almost no one except the church leadership could read or understand. It created a difficult situation because it meant that the Bible was only available through a single source in Europe, the Roman Catholic Church. And to make things quite messier at the time, the church essentially was also the state, as in the, the government. In most cases, the governments were the various kings and queens who functioned as an arm of the church and vice versa. Now today in our American political and legal system, People debate about what the phrase separation of church and state was intended to mean, but until the late 1700s, when the American colonies declared themselves independent of England, there was no debate because there was no Western nation that had a concept of a separation of church and state. One was an arm of the other, interconnected, and over time, it became more and more corrupt as time passed. You may be familiar with a quotation, you may not know where it came from, It's from a a gentleman named Lord Acton, a British politician in the 19th century, and he said the following, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He wrote this after looking on the history of what happens when one individual or one organization, no matter how well intended, no matter how well intended, if they have that much influence, the history is usually not good. And that was the case in Europe in the early 1500s. Now, just a few years ago, we remembered the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It was actually five years ago. The events that took place all those years ago this week had a significant influence on us because it started this long process in which God powerfully moved to reestablish a key doctrine that says, by grace through faith, not of works, are we saved. Now, having acknowledged that, we have to ask a question. How did the church wander so far off course during that 1,100-year period leading up to the early 1500s? I would suggest to you that certainly there was a corrupting influence of power and the unholy alliance between the government and the church all functioned as a breeding ground for some significant abuse. But I'm going to suggest there was another factor. And that was that the church's insistence the Bible had to remain in a language that not only was not the original, but was a language that almost nobody could read or understand. Now, on this whole question of language, 
and the importance that we be able to understand it. I'm going to give you some examples. I hope you'll find them amusing. And for those of you who are grammar Nazis in the room, you will probably be saying, yes, yes, yes. So I hope you appreciate the focus on specific sentence structure and how the smallest and most subtle change in a word or a punctuation changes the meaning significantly. Such as, when a comma is missing, a person's resume says something very different than what they had clearly intended. <laughs> or how about this one? Applications are now being accepted for two-year-old nursery workers. No, they're workers in the two-year-old nursery, not two-year-old nursery workers. And then, of course, there are famous church bulletin bloopers. Very well-intentioned people word things in a way that didn't come out the way they intended. For example, at the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> the way that things are worded affects meaning. And... Ladies, you will love this. A woman without her man is nothing. But with punctuation, a woman without her man is nothing. <laughs> My point is that wording, phrasing, punctuation have a huge impact on meaning. If the only acceptable version of the Bible was written in a language that nobody spoke and nobody could understand, you have a formula for trouble. That was the case in the early 1500s when a very obscure, and I might add a, a very troubled man, a German monk, was at the university in Wittenberg, Saxony, it's northeastern Germany, and his story is an example of how powerfully used one man to literally change the course of the history of the Christian church, the future of Western civilization, and the eternal destiny of untold number of souls over the past 500 years. Who am I speaking of? I'm speaking, of course, of Martin Luther. Now, let's be fully objective. I mean, many of you know that I was originally raised Missouri Synod Lutheran. I have a lot of respect for my Lutheran brothers and sisters. But Luther didn't get everything right. And quite honestly, his attitude toward the Jews is not something that can be defended. But God powerfully used him. And most likely, this world is very different today because God opened Martin Luther's mind to see the errors of the church of his day. Some of the things he struggled with are not that different than what we struggle with today. But his answers were always found in the same place, God's holy word. And that was one of the reasons why he struggled so much. He could read and understand Latin, but almost nobody else could. And so on this Reformation Sunday, we're going to revisit how powerfully God used him to begin the process of reestablishing the basis of salvation being by grace alone, through faith alone, based on the teaching of Scripture alone, through the sacrificial death of Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Those are often called the five solas. So let's consider the context here. In the early 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church is the overwhelming majority of the face of Christianity in Western Europe. You had the Eastern Orthodox Church in Eastern Europe and uh, the nations that eventually became Russia. But the point was is that Martin Luther is a Roman Catholic monk. By the way, he has a doctoral degree in theology. And he was taught salvation is by the grace of God, of course, plus the good works that he does, plus taking the sacraments, and plus the traditions of the church. And Luther was troubled by the plus factor. He was from what was called the Augustinian order, of the church, they named after Augustine, often considered the greatest theologian that ever lived. And as a young monk, Luther was deeply struggling with the meaning of a term that today we know as justification. You might say, what's that? I've heard that term. Well, a simple way of looking at it is that it means just as if I had never sinned. That's a bit simplistic, but it gives you a good analogy. When we're justified in the eyes of God, our sin is no longer held against us. In general, believing Christians across denominations agreed on the concept the disagreement was on how the Holy Spirit works and what the sequence is of redemption. 
But let's go back to language for a moment. Remember how I mentioned that the Latin translation of the Bible, sometimes called the Latin Vulgate. By the way, the term Vulgate comes from the word vulgar. It was written in the vulgar tongue. Today we think, oh, you mean it was dirty words? No, it was just the common language. That's what vulgar used to mean, the everyday language. But the point is, is that in Latin, the word for justification is a Latin term, justificare, in the accepted English translation means to become righteous. To become righteous. And first, let's define righteous. It means to be without error, without fault, without sin. But Luther knew his own internal struggles. He knew the struggles of the people in the church where he was their priest. And he knew that after everything that he had done for all the years, there was no way he had become righteous. He was still a sinner. And as a sinner, his eternal destination after his eventual death was a terrifying thought to him. And he struggled with this. If the teaching of the church that he served were true, he, a Roman Catholic priest with a doctorate in theology, who had dedicated years of service to the church and to the worship of his God, he had still yet to become righteous, and therefore he knew that his destiny for eternity was hell. And so the meaning of that Latin word in the Latin translation, justificare, was one of his first stumbling blocks because it said he would become righteous if he did all those things. That's the theological context, but there's a historical context to remember too. We're in a time called the Renaissance, the early 1500s, and it was the time period after the Dark Ages. All of Europe was experiencing a new birth, a fresh look at things. There were new discoveries in astronomy with the invention of the telescope. There were new technologies, the Gutenberg printing press, arguably the biggest breakthrough in mass communication until 400 years later when Morse code could be transmitted over carrier wave, essentially radio. Early 1500s, man's knowledge of the world was expanding. The church had trouble giving them answers. And so one of the things that was happening is that in the universities, they began to study original languages. And that meant students in theology looked at biblical Greek and Hebrew, much more so in the, than the previous thousand years. The Latin version of the Bible was written about 400 years after the time of Christ. Martin Luther wanted to find out what did the original languages say. And one of the things that he found was that the Greek word for justification, dikeahu, meant, here it is, meant to be declared righteous. Not to become righteous, but to be declared righteous. This was huge. One little word was a huge difference. And it was a pivotal point in the understanding of grace as being infused to us, which is the Roman Catholic view, as in a series of ongoing injections, versus that God's grace is imputed to us, which became the Protestant view that it's up front in one event the moment you first believe. And the point was that Luther knew he was still a sinner, but the original languages made it pretty clear that he had been declared righteous in the eyes of God. And he wrestled with that until he finally realized, you know what? I am a sinner and a saint at the same time. Simul justus et peccator was the Latin term. Now, as he studies more and more on this, he studies the original languages and he finds many teachings of the church at the time that had very limited basis in Scripture, such as the concept of purgatory, such as the sequence and the basis of our salvation. Somehow, the Latin translation, along with the corruption in the church leadership at that time, distorted the truth of the Holy Scriptures. For Luther, his awareness of all this started with that tiny yet huge difference of the word become righteous versus to be declared righteous. And here's the funny thing. Had people actually had the Bible in a version they could read, it was staring them in the face for all those years. Genesis 15, 6 in the Old Testament and Romans 4, 3 in the New say the same thing. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It confirmed Luther's point with Abraham in the Old Testament and with us today. We are saved by grace through faith. But there was a straw that broke 
the camel's back. When Martin Luther saw a man named Johann Tetzel sent from Rome to travel throughout Europe selling what they called indulgences. It was to raise money for the the construction of, among other things, the building today we know as St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. Now, Tetzel must have been a con artist to the nth degree. He took advantage of these uneducated peasants and he sold them a piece of paper that indicated purchased credit towards early release from purgatory for their deceased parents and grandparents, and even had a calling card. The phrase was the following, every time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Tetzel was a fraud. Luther could not remain silent anymore. And so the outraged Martin Luther sits down and he writes out this list of complaints against the church. His 95 thesis, it was called, is taken to the castle church there in Wittenberg, Germany. It's about 50 miles from Berlin. And tradition has it that he takes his list right to the door of the castle church and literally nails it to the door. Can you imagine? It's like marching down to your boss's office and hammering into the door a list of everything you think he's doing wrong. You can imagine the reaction of the church leadership and eventually of the pope. Now here's the thing. All of our evidence says Luther wanted to reform the church. He didn't want to start a denomination with his name. He wanted to purge and correct the church's errors. In the end, he was lucky that he wasn't executed. After years of strife, he was spared, certainly by the very hand of God, but also by something else, by the many writings that he had put together and now were distributed throughout northern Germany because of this amazing new invention, the printing press. And soon, A translation of the Bible was written in German so the people could read it in their own language in a way that they could understand. Now, there's a very famous account of Luther facing a tribunal in 1521. It was four years after he had nailed those lists to the door of the castle church. It took place in southwestern Germany, a city along the Rhine River. The name of the city is Worms, in English spelling W-O-R-M-S, Worms. And it was an assembly of the church hierarchy where they basically put him on trial. In Latin, that assembly is called a diet. And so this was the diet at Worms. They did not make him eat a diet of worms. But I have a 1953 film excerpt of a dramatic recreation of what happened there when Luther stood before the tribunal. Yesterday you admitted these writings were yours. Will you tell us now, do you persist in what you have written here, or are you prepared to retract these writings and the beliefs they contain? I ask pardon if I lack the manners that befit this court. I was not brought up in king's palaces, but in the seclusion of a cloister. I am asked to retract these writings, but they are of different kinds. In some I discuss faith and good works. If I were to retract these, I should be denying accepted Christian truths. In others, I attack popery and assail men who have afflicted the Christian world and ruined the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. Most serene emperor, illustrious princes, noble lords, I am only a man and not God. But I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, If I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. Martin Luther, you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you recant, or will you not? You ask for a simple answer. Here it is. 
Unless you can convince me by scripture, and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And so the meaning of one word, justification, was used powerfully by God through the courage and the faith of a fallen sinner, a man named Martin Luther, and the course of future history was forever changed. And all because Luther had faith and he trusted God to show him the way. And one phrase that he is known by is that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. Sola gratia et sola fide. Luther said, this is the article on which the, the, uh, the church stands or falls. Now, if you notice, the basis of his insight is found in Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Our faith must be rooted in God's Word, not in the creeds or the other historical writings. You've heard me say they're useful tools, but they are not equal to Scripture. Salvation is offered to any, whosoever, will repent and place their faith in the perfect and the complete sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And why is this necessary? Well, there's one little three-letter word that's not very popular today, sin. We owe a debt that we can never repay, and this is why Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. So please hear me. Please hear me. Jesus is who he says he is. The Bible is true. We don't need someone else to go through to have access to God. We do not need another intercessor. Christ is our intercessor. And how do we know that this is true? Well, I'll give you just a couple of examples. John 14, John 4, 16, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, three words, shall be saved. Not might be saved, not may hope to be saved. It's very emphatic. Shall be saved. And we can trust in the reliability of scriptures because among other things, even scripture itself says we can do so. In so many ways, what Luther set in place is almost a rehashing of our entire series on the core doctrines. And we can trace a lot of it back to what happened just over 500 years ago. But let's just address one other item. It's kind of an elephant in the room. And that little item is the word doubt. Every one of us faces elements of doubt. But if a a huge figure in church history like Martin Luther had his struggles and had his doubts. We certainly ought to know we'll have ours. Let those be times when God draws us close to himself. When we pray, we trust in the things both seen and unseen. Remember, God loves you. And yet, he knows, and you should know, that you and I both are still sinners. Saved by his grace, but still sinners. Declared innocent in the eyes of God, but still sinners. But it's through Christ that we have eternal life. And that comes from Scripture alone, and that was what Martin Luther was trying to tell them. Now, as a longtime church organist, I love many of the classic hymns, but arguably, The Mighty Fortress is Our God is the definitive hymn of the Lutheran denomination. In fact, it was written by Brother Martin himself. And yet it's used in the hymnals of a range of churches. The final words of this hymn are, Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, a man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, 
it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Every one of us are in a battle. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're in a spiritual battle with the forces of evil because Satan does not want you to grow in grace or in faith. And he certainly doesn't want you to share the powerful news of the gospel with others. And if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, you're in a battle. Satan doesn't want you to realize you need a Savior. He doesn't want you to place your faith in Jesus Christ. But with all of this, God is our mighty fortress. He was the fortress for Martin Luther and all the other reformers that followed him. Names like John Calvin in Geneva and Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich and John Knox in Edinburgh and Jakob Arminius in the Netherlands and John Wesley and George Whitfield in England and then later in colonial America. And they've all been powerfully used by God to reestablish his church for the purpose of sharing the good news of the gospel and to bring glory and honor to him. But it was 505 years ago tomorrow, God took the next step in this amazing sequence of events. And it's a miracle he continues every day to grow his church, to encourage and strengthen the faith of those who believe, to draw sinners to repentance and salvation through the calling of the Holy Spirit by the fully atoning death of the Son to the glory of God the Father. The Protestant Reformation officially began 505 years ago, but it continues yet today And it will continue when Jesus comes again. Until that time, together may we borrow Martin Luther's words. And may we say together, here we stand, we can do no other. God help us. Amen. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.